We rise early too, about 4.30 a.m., pack our belongings, have an early breakfast, and retrace our steps to the plane, which takes off about 6 o'clock. After leaving Midway, we climb up into our own world of clouds, white to sunward and gray the other way. Looking away a mile to the sun, the white becomes a distinct gold, and beyond the distant fringes is a burnt amber. Though through half-closed eyes, the effect is that of the oceans breaking into a golden beach. Here and there are mass clouds projecting above the general level with their dark sides towards us, but their outer edges are brilliantly illuminated, and in places they are pierced with a delicately diffused light. Soon I began to sympathize with those earlier air travelers who described cloud effects ad nauseum. Then I had dismissed the matter, supposing it to be merely an alcohol effect, aggravated in some cases by the existence of an alcoholic haze. But now I realize that, while one seeks those seldom used words needed to describe a particularly striking formation, several equally important effects have slipped past my window. Such is the unceasing variety in the scene. It is 8.10 a.m., and we take an unusual plunge upward, and for a few awful seconds seem to hesitate before regaining our aplomb. We can see there is some confusion in the navigator's room. Hasty calculations by Noonan are made known to Captain Music. After studying these, his face breaks into a smile, and in the connecting doorway he announced, It was the date line, and we got over it without a scratch. In a few minutes, our steward proceeds the length of the ship, beating a spoon upon his tray to call the company to order. This being accomplished, Captain Music, acting as the accredited representative of Zeus, presents each of us in turn with a signed diploma worded as follows. Domain of Phoebus Apollo, ruler of the sun and heavens, know all peoples that Edward Breyer, once earth-bound and time-laden, is now declared a subject of the realm of the sun and of the heavens, with the freedom of our sacred eagle, that with the speed of our flaming chariot, this subject did fly the Pacific skies over the international dateline, which mortals designed to mark off in the limit of days our eternal course through the skies, that by so crossing this divide of days between the earth isles of wake and midway, and the today of mortals at once becomes yesterday, and all is confusion, that this subject is commanded to hold ever close this celestial dec decree, so that in the final accounting of earthly days the balance will stand true done in the realm of the sun and of the heavens by the order of Phoebus Apollo Rex, son of Zeus and Leto, Captain Music, Emissary, Planet Potentiary. The meals on the plains are satisfactory. At 9.10 a.m. midway time, we have bouillon and crackers. At noon, soup and crackers. Swiss steak, carrots, rolls, and butter and coffee. We generally have a dessert of pudding or fruit, as well as a salad. On long hops, there are refreshments during the afternoon. This day, we land at 1.11 p.m. wake time. Wake is an atoll of three sandy islands entirely enclosed by a reef. There is a large lagoon within the islands, which forms a horseshoe just within the reef. The greatest elevation is 17 feet. There is scrubby growth covering the sand, which is thickly populated by fishing birds. Hermit crabs are found everywhere along the beaches. The water is warm and the fish are plentiful. At Midway, water suitable for irrigation is found, but not at Wake. All fresh water must be collected from the roofs of buildings or obtained by distillation. At wake, there is a landing within the lagoon at which the clipper is tied for refueling and inspection. Wake has no vehicles except a tractor. 
Wake is 2,000 miles west of Honolulu and it may be feasible to make the hop directly under favorable conditions. The hop from Wake to Guam is greater than either of the two preceding it and the weather is the worst encounter. Fortunately we have tailwinds and made a landing 9 hours 50 minutes after taking off. There is time for little sightseeing before we are due in Aganya, where the naval governor gives a dinner for the passengers on our plane and for the guests one trip took out to China. Mr. Tripp did not return by this plane. There's not space here to give you many further details of this trip. We reached Manila late in the afternoon of the following day and spent three days there. It took four days of flying to reach Honolulu on the afternoon of November 2nd, 1936. We had been away 11 days and 10 nights. Going west, we were in the air 36 hours, 59 minutes, and returning 43 hours, 21 minutes. Entire distance flown approximately 11,600 miles. The average speed west was 156 miles per hour and east was 134 miles per hour. Our longest hops were each 12 hours 30 minutes, namely from Manila to Guam and again from Guam to Wake. It is interesting to know that a recent flight from Manila to Guam took over 17 hours. This shows the great effect of wind on air flight. Adequate information on air conditions is most essential in trans-Pacific flying. Because three out of every four people ask me whether I was anxious about the safety of such a flight, I will say that I was not, and as far as I could tell, this was also true of the other passengers. A heavy ship like the Clipper is not subject to as many deviations as one might expect. Every effort is bent to avoid any sudden changes in direction. Ascents and descents are almost invariably made at uniform rates. Weather is carefully avoided. The ship can fly on three motors and perhaps on two. Because of the lack of traffic perhaps, actually the record of aircraft is better than that of automobiles. And yet when you and I get into an automobile to make a trip, we feel perfectly safe about it. When you come to Hawaii, fly. Mr. Byers final confident comments about airline safety could have been said by any one of us today. However, I think we should know that the men flying these airplanes were real pioneers of their time. They were among the most experienced aviators of their day and the first pilots to attempt to fly the vast Pacific Ocean. Here Captain Music is pictured with Charles Lindbergh. Many of these men made the ultimate sacrifice for the progress of modern aviation. John Rogers, the Navy pilot that made the first attempt to reach Hawaii in August 1925 with his seaplane, died almost one year to the day on August 28, 1926, while attempting to land in Philadelphia. Sir Charles Edward Kingsford Smith, who made the first trans-Pacific flight from the United States to Australia, in 1928 disappeared in the early hours of 8 November 1935 over the Andaman Sea during his attempt to break the England to Australia speed record. Fred Noonan, the navigator, is pictured here with Amelia Earhart. He was a veteran of 12 Pacific Ocean crossings and was serving as her expert navigator when they disappeared without a trace during her attempt to circle the world on July 2, 1937. This narrator's father was a Navy ROTC cadet on the battleship Colorado at the time and participated in the search for Earhart and Noonan. On January 11, 1938, Captain Music flying the Samoan Clipper on the first scheduled mail and cargo flight to New Zealand died when the S-42 he was flying exploded as he tried to return to Pango Pango after one engine failed and he attempted to dump fuel. The Hawaii Clipper which Mr. Breyer flew to Manila disappeared without a trace while flying from Guam to Manila on July 29, 1938. 
There are some theories that the Japanese hijacked the plane or shot it down as Japan was then at war with China. The Philippine Clipper, flying for the U.S. Navy from Hawaii, crashed into a mountain north of San Francisco in poor weather on July 21, 1943. The China Clipper, the last of the three M-130 Clippers, crashed attempting to land in the port of Spain, Trinidad, July 8, 1945, but it had successfully flown over three million miles.